Why did you leave the former president's legal team? So, as I said at the time, it had nothing to do with the case itself or the client. The real reason is because there are certain individuals that made defending the president much harder than it needed to be. That was Timothy Parlatori, one of Donald Trump's former lawyers. Mr. Parlatori used to represent Trump in the Mar-a-Lago documents investigation. And since Parlatori left Trump's legal team a few weeks ago, we have known that there was trouble in paradise. But tonight, new reporting shows just how serious that trouble actually is. The Daily Beast is reporting about a meeting last month at Mar-a-Lago where several of Trump's lawyers threatened to leave. Two sources described the meeting to the Daily Beast as, quote, an intervention. The outlet says the lawyers' concerns here were twofold. Number one, Trump is under investigation for so many things that his legal team is massive, and these lawyers do not all get along. But more than not getting along, these lawyers are also wondering if one of them could be a snitch. Quote, what's really driving the deepest distrust is the way special counsel Jack Smith's investigators have started turning up the heat on Trump's own lawyers. By our count, at least seven Trump lawyers have either testified to Jack Smith's grand jury or they have met with federal investigators. And it seems like these attorneys are starting to get worried about going down with the ship here. After quitting, Timothy Parlatori went on national television to say that another Trump lawyer, Boris Epstein, had attempted to interfere with Parlatori's search for classified documents at Trump's New Jersey golf club, which is not exactly the picture of everyone rowing in the same direction. And today, The Guardian is out with new reporting about the Trump lawyer who is the liaison between Trump and the DOJ. Evan Corcoran, that lawyer, was in charge of returning the classified documents to the department. Now, Corcoran reportedly told associates that in June of last year, he was waved off searching any room at Mar-a-Lago beside a, besides a single storage room. When Mr. Corcoran was looking for classified documents, he was told to check that one room and not to check anywhere else. He was waved off from searching places like Trump's office, which is where, of course, months later, the FBI would find the most highly classified documents. This reporting suggests, again, that not everyone is rowing in the same direction here, and it would also seem to buttress a potential obstruction case, a case that, if you read the reporting, already seems pretty strong. So at this point, it certainly seems like a lot of Trump lawyers are effectively saying, not it. And that makes sense. Remember that last week, The Washington Post and The New York Times reported that a Trump employee turned witness has told special counsel Smith that Trump ordered workers to move boxes back into the storage room right before his lawyer, Evan Corcoran, searched that storage room. And all that happened one day before federal investigators came to collect the documents. So was that Trump trying to mislead his own lawyers? Were some of Trump's lawyers also actively trying to mislead other Trump lawyers? And with so many lawyers testifying in these investigations, Will any of them flip to save their own hides? We might not have to wait that long to find out. Bloomberg reported late last week that special counsel Smith is poised to announce criminal charges in this investigation in the days or weeks after Memorial Day, which was yesterday. We have lots to discuss. Joining me now is Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and, of course, co-host of the Sisters in Law podcast. Joyce, thank you so much for being here tonight. I, I, I don't have a law degree, but a lot of people do, and a lot of them are working for Donald Trump and also have testified either to federal investigators or in front of the federal grand jury. I, I, I want to pull up this graphic we have. I think there are seven Trump lawyers by our count who have either testified to the, the grand jury that the special counsel has convened or met with uh, the DOJ investigators on this. That seems like an unusually high number to me, Joyce. Does that seem like a lot of lawyers to you? And do you think that the, these lawyers are actually emerging as potential liabilities for Donald Trump? It does seem like an exceptionally high number, Alex. And to give it a little bit of context, DOJ prosecutors are required by policy to be very careful when they're dealing with someone's lawyer, especially when that someone is a target 
And I, I think it's safe to assume that in this case, people are being extremely rigorous about following those policies. So, for instance, you can't search a lawyer's office without jumping through a lot of hoops. Any sort of contact requires approval at high levels of the department. And what we've seen here repeatedly is a successful effort by prosecutors to pierce the attorney-client privilege with the crime fraud exception, which in essence means that Trump is either conspiring to engage in criminal activities with his lawyers or he is using them. The lawyer may not know what they're being used for, but Trump is, is using their advice to perpetrate criminal conduct. That really adds up to a very unusual sort of situation here. I, I, I would, you know, in the same Daily Beast reporting, there is a list of effectively of all the lawyers working on all the cases. And it is kind of a staggering number of attorneys. And first of all, the number of the legal of uh, the number of probes and then the number of lawyers working on those separate probes. I mean, give us a sense from your background on the flip side of this, uh, how unusual it is to be battling so many legal fronts with a, a different uncoordinated group, not uncoordinated, a group of lawyers who are not coordinating their movements necessarily with the other groups and how complicating that would be for a defendant. Well, it's sort of tough for me to do that because I've never um, had a case against a former president who had four separate criminal investigations into his conduct. But I think the best sort of parallel that I can give you would be in a public corruption case or perhaps in a white collar fraud case where there are multiple allegations against a defendant or a group of people. And typically, there's a fairly unified command structure among the lawyers. You know, here we know that Evren Corcoran has done a lot of the coordinating with DOJ. And yet it doesn't always appear to be the case that he has the sort of contact with the client that you would expect someone in that role to have. Here's what you need to be able to do as the lawyer. If you're going to be certifying, for instance, that you've turned over all of the classified material or the presidential records material in your client's possession, then you need to be able to ascertain that from the client to a certainty. And you can't be restricted in your movements and, and where you search. So this entire notion that perhaps, I mean, this is, I guess, the worst case reading, but boxes were being moved in, in and out of storage areas before Corcoran was permitted to search, and that someone, maybe the president, maybe someone else was going through those folders and, and perhaps removing material so it wouldn't be found. And it was only after that whole level of shenanigans that material was turned over to DOJ. You know, that's not a position you would expect any lawyer in a functional team to be placed in. Donald Trump currently faces legal peril on multiple fronts, and the strategy he often uses to tackle these issues is not a secret. He makes his enemies the enemies of his followers. He attacks them in public. He tries to ruin their careers. Sometimes he even defames them. That is a Trump playbook, and it has been for years. But now that his legal troubles have piled up considerably, Trump is making his fight against his enemies more explicit. In new reporting today, Rolling Stone magazine details how Trump is trying to go after the FBI and the Justice Department agents who are currently investigating him. Quote, in recent months, the former president has asked close advisors, including at least one of his personal attorneys, if we know all the names of senior FBI agents and Justice Department personnel who have worked on the federal probes into him. Trump has then privately discussed that should he return to the White House, it is imperative his new Department of Justice quickly and immediately purge the FBI and DOJ, DOJ's ranks of these officials and agents who've led the Trump-related criminal investigations. During some of the conversations this year, including at Trump's Florida club Mar-a-Lago, some of Trump's close political allies told him they are working on figuring out the identities of the FBI and DOJ staff and forming lists. So the time-tested Trump playbook is operational here in a big way, but some things, at least, are different this time around, like this. The Justice Department is not making it easy for Trump. According to Rolling Stone, the DOJ appears to be stonewalling Trump's allies, who are asking for the names of those hired by the special counsel to investigate Trump. The department is also obscuring the names of the special counsel's lawyers and personnel on official emails, according to a source with direct knowledge of the situation. 
Joining us now is someone who knows exactly what it is like to be a personal target of Donald Trump, former FBI agent Peter Strzok. Not only was he removed from the special counsel's Russia investigation back in 2017, but he was later fired from the FBI after more than 20 years of service. Peter, it's great seeing you. Thanks for being my guest this evening. There's really no better person to speak with. Does this reporting feel like vindication for you in, in your search to find out exactly what happened here, get to the bottom of your firing? Is it proof that Trump has a kill list? Well, Alex, I don't know that I'd call it vindication. It's certainly confirmation that what Trump did in the end of his last uh, administration. He's absolutely going to come back uh, with full vengeance the next time around. I mean, it's hard for me to overstate what an assault on the rule of law this is. It's essentially somebody who is running for president saying, if you dare investigate me, I'm going to fire you. And there is nobody out in America who should, this is something out of a banana republic. There is no person above the law, but clearly this is something that Trump is saying, trying to proactively identify people who are working on investigations related to him and saying years out from his presidency, I'm going to fire these people as soon as I can, if and when I regain power. So it is absolutely something we saw him doing, as you indicated, you know, me, folks like Director Comey, Deputy Director Andy McCabe, other folks who were fired, very much saw this in action. And Trump has doubled down, saying, yes, I've done it, like he frequently does. He goes up to the line. When he sees no resistance at that line, he just pushes forward. So I'm deeply worried about what happens in a future Trump administration to all these folks who are working day and night with special counsel Jack Smith and others to try and hold Trump to account for his potentially uh, illegal acts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably not just about a second Trump term, too. It could just be marching orders for the current Republicans who are running committees in Congress. We know that uh, uh, effectively doing Trump's bidding are Jim Jordan, who is chair of the House Judiciary Committee, is trying to get Alvin Bragg up to the Hill. We know that the House Oversight Committee chair has de has decided to um, hold the FBI director, Trump's FBI director, Christopher Wray, in contempt of Congress. I mean, there are very real consequences for Trump targeting these folks in real time right now. And I would ask you, to be an investigator in the FBI or the DOJ, what is it like working under that pressure in that spotlight? Well, that's absolutely right. I mean, look, when I was working with special counsel Mueller, we were all very well aware of the statements that were coming out of Trump's mouth, the statements that are coming out of Congress. Did that make anybody afraid to do their job? No. Were investigators and attorneys certainly aware of it? Yes. And, Alex, you're absolutely right. This is not just a future potential harm. Not only is Trump threatening these people with their jobs and their livelihood, but more, you know, if you look at what is going on right now, the fact of the matter is threats, physical threats of violence that are coming into FBI agents, including the names of individuals who took part in the uh, search warrant down at Mar-a-Lago, attacks on FBI facilities, including a field office in the Midwest. This isn't just a future threat of your job. This is a current threat of violence simply based on Trump and those around him trying to identify people, trying to intimidate them and prevent them from doing their job. Trump, if you recall, in the past two months, has been indicted on 34 counts of falsifying business records to conceal hush money payments and found liable by a jury for defamation and battery. Despite all of that, a majority of Republicans still believe Trump would be their strongest nominee in 2024. According to a new Monmouth University poll, almost half of Republican and Republican-leaning voters think Trump is definitely their strongest candidate to beat President Biden in 2024, while another 18 percent think he is probably their strongest candidate. If you do the math there, that is 63 percent of Republican and Republican-leaning voters who think that Donald Trump is either probably or definitely the strongest Republican candidate for 2024. The Monmouth poll was conducted just as Governor DeSantis geared up to officially announce his candidacy, but it remains to be seen whether his official entry into this race will fend off other potential challengers because so far... It hasn't. The ever-expanding field already includes Trump's first U.N. ambassador, former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott, and a handful of other lesser-known conservative personalities. The list goes on, though. 
The New York Times reports today that allies of former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie have created a super PAC to support Christie in the Republican primary and that he is likely to kick off his campaign in the next two weeks. Over the holiday weekend, New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu said he will decide whether or not he's throwing his hat into the ring in the next week or two. Also in the next week or two, according to the Wall Street Journal, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum is expected to announce his candidacy at an event in Fargo a week from tomorrow. And then there is still former Vice President Mike Pence, who said back in April that he will make a decision well before late June, which I guess is now early or mid-June, a decision on whether or not to enter the presidential race. At this point, the 2024 Republican primary is starting to feel very reminiscent of the 2016 Republican primary, which featured 17 major candidates who ended up splitting the vote and handing the nomination to Donald Trump. So there's that. Right now, Speaker Kevin McCarthy is wrapping up a meeting with the House Republican Conference on that bipartisan debt limit deal he brokered with the White House. The bill is headed to the full House for a vote tomorrow after it cleared its first procedural hurdle this evening, passing the House Rules Committee by a vote of seven to six. Punchbowl News reports tonight that going into that Republican conference meeting, Speaker McCarthy got a standing ovation and that he told Republican members, quote, there's nothing in there for Democrats. I've never seen a bill that you can't point to one thing that the other side got. Joining us now is Ryan Nobles, NBC Capitol Hill correspondent. Ryan, thanks for joining me. I know this is an ongoing situation. Is there any sense that Democrats are going to balk at voting for this in large numbers? I guess it would depend on your definition of large numbers, Alex. I, I do think that there will be a significant block of Democrats uh, that end up voting no. But if you'll notice, there have been a lot of conservative Republicans that have declared their no votes and hardly any, if any, uh, Democrats that have come right out and said no. And I, and I do think that's because there is a degree of loyalty to the White House and they're judging to see just how many Republican votes Kevin McCarthy can deliver, and then a lot of uh, how much we see Democrat support, uh, you know, rise or fall will depend a lot on that. The, ha Hakeem Jeffries, who's the, of course, uh, leader of the minority, uh, told us that he believes Kevin McCarthy uh, can deliver as many as 150 votes and that Democrats will fill in that gap, whatever that may be. So you're only talking about 70 or 80 Democratic votes that would be necessary to get this over the finish line. I think it's going to end up being a lot more than that. But there's no doubt when you have divided government, uh, you have to come up with a compromise piece of legislation. So that means you're going to lose progressive Democrats and you're going to lose conservative Republicans. Republicans, and that's how it gets over the finish line. And I do end up uh, thinking that's how this is going to turn out. Yeah, I guess I was asking that in part because McCarthy is so gleefully saying there is nothing in there for Democrats and then also <laughs> expecting that large Democrats will vote for something that, you know, a deal that he put in motion. To that end, McCarthy getting a standing ovation reportedly in this House Republican conference. Can you tell me about his standing right now inside the party? You mentioned conservative Republicans who aren't happy with this, but is there any price that he will pay for any of this? You know, Alex, I, I do think we don't talk about this enough, that these voices that are critical of Kevin McCarthy within the Republican Party, uh, they are very loud. Uh, they have the ability to command a microphone. Uh, they do a very good job of getting their message out specifically to the conservative base, but they are not large in numbers. The overwhelming majority of the Republican Party within the House of Representatives is very supportive of Kevin McCarthy. Uh, you know, it played out in a dramatic way during the speaker's contest because it took only a few of them to break away from the conference to deny him uh, that speaker's gavel. Uh, you know, in aggregate, most of the Republican members are supportive of, Repu of Kevin McCarthy. So it's not a surprise that he would go into that room and getting a standing ovation because they do support him. And I do think that that will play itself out with a great deal of specificity during this vote tomorrow. You're going to see most Republicans vote yes on this piece of legislation. Do they all love it? No. But they do understand that a compromise was necessary uh, to prevent the country from defaulting. And the fact that they even got Joe Biden to negotiate at all uh, when his original stance was that there was no negotiation related to a debt ceiling indicates that McCarthy did make uh, some inroads uh, in these conversations. So, you know, McCarthy is not beloved by any stretch of the imagination, uh, but he does have the support and he's been able to cobble this group together and, you know, 20, 25, maybe 30 people uh, that are very loud on the right and complaining about him do not indicate uh, the overall sense of this conference in any way, shape or form.
Ryan Nobles in the center of the action. Thanks for the update, Ryan. Appreciate it.